Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. What's your ethnicity? Small amount of housekeeping. Uh, the hashtag for today is uh, Foxtrot Charlie, bravo, bravo, Charlie. Alpha, you can see at the top there. Um, if you ask questions, can you please wait for the microphone and ask your question with a, with a microphone? Um, just to uh, inform you that today's event is done uh, in collaboration with BBC Arabic, so thank you, BBC Arabic. And finally, to say this is our last event this year, and to thank you all for coming to our events and supporting our programme this year. I'm now handing over to John Snow. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul, and what a delight it is to be here tonight, and what a thrilling looking audience. Very exciting looking audience. And I'm just casting about, and I can see some familiar faces and some unfamiliar faces. But what I can see is a fantastic mix of people, which you would expect at the LSE, and you would expect for this subject, which could be discussed almost any day of any week in any year in the last however long we want to discuss. Uh, so it's a very, very good time to be meeting. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, Azadia Mervani, former Middle East correspondent for Time magazine. She is Irano-Turk, so that's a lovely combination. Um, much sought after. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, she's reported on Iran since 1999. Uh, she's the author of Lipstick Jihad. Honeymoon in Tehran, co-author with Nobel Peace Laureate uh, Shirin Ibadi, um, Iran Awakening, uh, and she writes a lot on Iran and the Middle East generally. Meir uh, Jevandava Danva, who is in fact both Iranian and Israeli, um, and he's an Israeli uh, Middle East analyst. He teaches contemporary Iranian politics course. Gosh, that must be a fluid experience, uh, or perhaps <laughs> not, at the uh, uh, Interdisciplinary Center in Hatzalia. He's co-author of President Ahmadinejad's biography, The Nuclear Sphinx of Tehran, and a regular contributor to The Diplomat, um, and as well as to BBC Persian. Uh, Scott Peterson, uh, Istanbul Bureau Chief for the... I've told you never just to bring me in the office. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, these things happen, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, will you please turn off your mobiles? Um, <laughs> Scott Peterson, rudely interrupted by my telephone there. Uh, a photographer of Getty Images, author of Let the Swords Encircle Me, Iran, A Journey Behind the Headlines. He's reported and photographed conflict and human narratives across three continents for more than two decades, which include 30 extended reporting trips to Iran since 1996. And finally, uh, Abdul Bari Atwan, uh, editor of the London-based Al-Quds, uh, an independent uh, pan-Arab daily newspaper since 1989. He's author of The Secret History of Al-Qaeda, A Country of Words, his memoir and his new book, Al-Qaeda, The Next Generation, born in Gaza but has lived in London since 1979. So many people have been born in Gaza or indeed on the West Bank and are somewhere else in the world. He happens to be here. Uh, and me, uh, I'm a hack. I work for Channel 4 News. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm some kind of an Iranophile in the sense that I've been there a lot. I was there, I now declare my age. Uh, I was there for the revolution. I was there for the hostage crisis, or a lot of it. Uh, in fact, ITN, for whom I was working, wanted to bring me back because there were no British hostages. Um, and um, ABC picked me up and said, well, would I work for them? So I worked for them for about six months during the hostage crisis. Uh, I was also one of the only people to get to Desert One, where the Carter effort to rescue the hostages failed so dreadfully. Uh, and I've been back a few times since, a lot of times since, uh, including uh, a transmission of a whole <coughs> week of news from Iran, during which we managed to break the surly bonds of restriction and uh, broadcast from Gom, uh, and indeed from Esfahan, as well as the more obvious places like Shiraz and Tehran. I've interviewed Ahmadinejad perhaps three times, I think now, maybe four. Um, and they all seem to rumble into one, uh, but there it is. <laughs> um, and that's it, there we are. So what I'm gonna ask is each to give us really a very, very short uh, kind of top of the head thought right now, kind of three minutes each. You know, I know this academic institution likes 30 minutes each, but it's gonna be three minutes each just to sort of begin to set the scene, then we'll have a sort of bit of a discussion between ourselves, and then we will engage you like never before. So um, prepare for a, a very stimulating evening. And I want to start with you, Abdul Bari Atwan, your take on uh, Iran-Israel as we speak. 
Well, actually, I can see the scenario of Iraq is going to be repeated vis-a-vis -vis Iran. I think the Israelis are banging the drums of war against Iran the way they did against Saddam Hussein and his weapon of mass destruction. Uh, I believe if actually the Israeli and the American decided to go to war, this war actually could change the face of the Middle East for maybe tens of years to come. It could be a very determined war for the whole region. When I say, you know, it's uh, a comparison between Saddam Hussein and Iran because the Israeli don't want any regional power uh, possessing weapon of mass destruction because they want these weapons actually to be exclusive to the Israelis so they can scare the people of the Middle East and they can actually expand as they like. When I say it could actually change the face of the Middle East, suppose you, the Israeli and the American decided to bomb Iran and many people, including Israeli analysts, say that could be April, could be May next year. So if they- Could be October last year. It could be October last year. I mean, but how long has this been going on? Yeah, it's exactly, a lot of speculation, and most of it from the Israelis, not from us. Anyway, so, so we have to blame the Israeli for everything in the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> But, you know, I, actually, they deserve to be blamed anyway. <laughs> uh, so uh, what will happen if the Israeli decided to go and bomb the Iranian nuclear facilities and nuclear programs in Qom, in uh, uh, Bushahar, and what will happen? Definitely the Iranian will retaliate. And the Israeli are preparing themselves for that. The war against Gaza, which lasted about eight days, it was to test the Iranian missiles in the position of Hamas and Al-Jihad al-Islamic. And also they want to test the Iron Domes, which are supposed to actually intercept all kinds of missiles coming from Iran in particular. So uh, I can see there is, there is a strong case of war, not of peace in that part of the world. So if the Israeli decided to bomb Iran, to bomb Iran nuclear facilities, what will happen? Definitely the Iranian will retaliate. We know that, that Hezbollah, for example, who is actually uh, the arm of Iran in, in Lebanon, when they had a war with the Israeli, they th launched more than 4,000 missiles against the Israeli in 2006. So imagine if the, Isra if the uh, Iranian decided to retaliate, where they have a lot of uh, missiles, thousands, maybe a hundred, tens of thousands of uh, missiles, all ranges. So the Iranian also will bomb the oil fields in the Gulf, American bases there. And the most dangerous thing could happen, actually, the Iranian have a very speed boats. And these boats actually could be used as a suicide attacks against the, the, the people in the region mm -hmm. there, and also to destroy the desalination plant. Imagine desalination. Just, just, just a moment. The, 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 uh, forgive me for butting in, but the, is the, the one is, thing you is, could say about Iran is that there's no real history of suicide activity. No, they are. Actually. So you think they're going to start up? Actually, they will. Um, I heard. I mean, it from it's not a sheer practice, is it? It is a sheer Flagellation, practice. Flagellation, yes. It, but no, it, happened, it happened. It happened in South Lebanon when the Israeli occupied South Lebanon. There were a lot of suicidal attacks against the Israelis. By Iranians? Uh, by Iranians, yes. No, by by Lebanese. All right, well, that's by what Lebanese. I'm putting yeah. to you. Yeah. Yeah. You've, yeah. Just, you've just talked about. Sheer Iranians, sheer Iranians committing suicide in attacking another country. And I've not had I'm not any evidence that's no, no. ever happened. No, no. I, I heard it from a very, very high Gulf uh, officials. He said, you know, we are scared. Why? Because 90% of the Gulf fully dependent on desalination plants. So if they want to actually attack this, that's what I heard. And they are well, scared in the Gulf from that. I'm going to pause you there. That's what I would call a worst case scenario. Yeah. This is right. it. Right. Okay. It's always good to have the base from which we go forward. Yeah. And that, I think, is the yeah. base. I mean, that's tough So, but that's why, tough why stuff. the Iranian actually should stay and the Israeli and the American bomb them and they don't retaliate against the American bases on, on the Gulf? Right. So this is, this well, is well, expected. And, uh, and what about I'm the uh, oil prices, which put, could jump also? Uh, Hormuz well, the Street, The grand can conspiracy be comes together in one almighty Wall Street horror. But do you want, do you want the, um, the Iranian to sit like that and say, please, Israeli, come and bomb us? Well, uh, let's hold it. <laughs> let's hold it there. Why not let's turn to an Israeli analyst and see what... Uh, I would rather you gave your own idea rather than, uh, sure. so far, question Abdul Barry Ackman. Sure. Um, I think Iran and Israel are going through a natural divorce. <clears throat> There's no reason for the Iranian people and the Israeli people to be enemies. We have no history of animosity. Um, 
in the, uh, Iran, Persia is one of, is the only country that has in fact influenced the uh, history of Judaism uh, from the exile that we were saved by King Cyrus and by the, by the Persian people. Um, I belong to a community of uh, two and a half thousand year old Persian Jewish community. And I can tell you that uh, people of Israel and people of Iran are not, are not enemies. Now the issue of what happens with the government is different. Um, I don't think there'll be war. I don't think there'll be a unilateral Israeli strike against Iran for a number of reasons. Number one, we see that the sanctions and the diplomacy are hurting the Iranian regime very badly. Number two, we see that there's nobody in this world who does a better job of delegitimizing the Iranian government and makes the Iranian government uh, look unsuitable to own a nuclear weapon than the Iranian government. Mm -hmm. They do an incredible job Unfortunately, Mr. Netanyahu keeps ruining it. Uh, but you know, if he, Mr. Netanyahu, and I, and I know he's a politician, he's got his job to do, but sometimes I would just hope that he would just stay quiet and let the Iranian government do the job for us because bless them, there's nobody else with his acts that, that's better than convincing the international community why the Iranian regime should not have a nuclear weapon. I don't think the Iranian regime is going to make a nuclear weapon. Um, I'm, I think they want to, but I don't think they'll be able to. The sanctions and the diplomacy are creating a lot of damage. Diplomacy with Iran is essential because it enforces the moderates within the regime, and this creates infighting, and sanctions are hurting the Iranian regime, and they're hurting its business interests. I don't see Ayatollah Khamenei having the confidence to tell his, his officers that tomorrow we're going to kick out all the IAEA inspectors, we're going to take that enriched uranium at Natanz and Fordo, and we're going to make a bomb with it. Because the moment he does that, that's the moment he's going to risk an American attack. And I don't think Israel would attack, despite what Mr. Netanyahu says. I don't think the Iranian regime is going to do it. And if I may be so bold, I'll, I'll make the prediction that not only Iran won't, won't make a bomb, that Iran will make a compromise. We're probably going to look at a deal when Iran is going to give up its enriched uranium at 20%, close down Fordo agree to very strict uh, inspection regime, but in return have all the sanctions, at least from Europe for now, lifted, and some kind of um, and limited enrichment on Iranian soil. I'd just like to finish that next time you're in Israel, you can do a little test yourself. Sit in an Israeli taxi, ask the taxi driver, what do you think about Arabs, and what do you think about Persians? You'll see the difference, and you'll see how these two people are going. They've got so much in common. The view is positive, and we're not going to get, let war get in the way of the history and the bond, the eternal bond which the people of Israel and Iran have. Thank you. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, Scott, uh, your top of the head. Well, one, one thing I'd like to point out uh, right at the top is that if we were able to take all of the political and rhetorical hot air, the threats that have emerged from Washington, that have come from Tel Aviv, and that have come from Tehran, probably there'd be no need at all for any kind of nuclear uh, power plants anywhere in the world. I mean, it's an endless <laughs> thing. It's gone on for decades. And, uh, you know, really, that's the kind of context that we should put these, these threats into. I mean, one of the stories uh, that I put together earlier this year was looking at a timeline of all the threats and predictions that have come, in this case specifically from Israel, about when Iran was going to get a bomb. And it started in 1992. And of course, back then, you know, it was like three years, four years hence. And we've had that same three or four year dynamic going on year after year after year. So anyway, all the commentary that is heard by politicians should be put in that kind of a, a context. So well, we're looking forward to what's going to be happening in, in uh, 2013. First of all, with anyone who knows Iran well, as everyone on this uh, on the panel here does, will will agree that predictions are foolhardy when it comes to Iran. All of the most important political changes that have taken place in Iran in the last 15 years have been unpredictable. We had the victory of Khatami. We had this election just in 2009. A lot of other events in the meantime, which you simply could not have predicted um, at the time. So. What's going to happen in the next year? I won't make any predictions. However, there are contexts that Iran is operating in and events that are likely to, uh, to be happening. First of all, we have an election, a presidential election, coming up this year. And probably because of that, because of the fact that President Ahmadinejad is finishing his, uh, finishing his, his second tour, 
and there's going to be uncertainty about who will be the next president, this is probably going to lessen Iran's willingness to make a deal in the short term over the nuclear, over the nuclear issues. Likewise, if Syria collapses in the coming several months, this is going to be a critical element of what Iran has always called its axis of resistance, its ability to reach out across you know, the Arab world and say we have a strong ally and we are basically fighting the good fight against Israel, against the United States, against, uh, against these, uh, these other elements. So if Iran loses Syria, then this also will put it into a weaker strategic position, which will probably also make it less likely or willing to make a deal on the, uh, on the, nuclear, um, on the nuclear issue. Now, speaking of, uh, of the nuclear issue, we've been following in great detail this year the P5 plus one negotiations with Iran. I've been at every one of those sessions in Baghdad, in Moscow, there have been several in Istanbul as well. And I'm afraid I'm not particularly optimistic about the way that they have been going so far. The way they've been handled so far is that it, the point we're at now is that the P5 plus one have, prevent, have presented a very uh, maximalist view toward Iran that hasn't shifted in the last two or three sessions. And they're basically insisting that Iran give over its primary cards as goodwill measures before it will then even think about lifting sanctions or easing some kind, of, some kind of sanctions. Now, the American election is over. Will that dynamic change? We'll see. Will the Iranians still be able to deal? Or will they be able to follow through on things that they've at least hinted uh, might lead to, uh, lead to a result? We don't know yet, because this, uh, this arrangement hasn't been made. The two other uh, quick points I'll make. One is that I just want to throw this out there. Um, and it's a question, uh, going back to what Mayor was speaking about, was whether or not Iran is interested in having a bomb. I agree with him that I don't think that Iran necessarily wants or is willing to get a bomb on the face of it at the moment. We've had Iran's supreme leader state increasingly emphatically over the last year that Iran has, wants nothing to do with this. However, I think that the final decision isn't probably going to be Iran's, but it will be Iran's reaction to the threats that it receives from the United States and Israel. And if it takes those threats so seriously that it feels that the only way to preserve its Islamic system is by having a nuclear weapon, then it will then make the decision. The second point I'll just make is on sanctions and the impact. Certainly they have been effective at damaging Iran's economy. There's no question about that. But in terms of actually being effective for what they are meant to do, which is change Iran's nuclear program, we haven't seen one bit of this happening yet. So one thing that I would warn, we've had, a, we've had a, um, a, uh, an interesting um, release of a CIA document about Iran, about Iraq, uh, that, was that was made by the CIA, an after action report, if you will, from the WMD fiasco on Iraq. And I just want to read a line from the result of that, because I think that we're getting, we're, we're shifting in this dangerous direction uh, with, the, um, with, the, uh, with the Iranians. The CIA analyzed that analysts tended to focus on what was most important to us, the hunt for WMD, and less on what would be most important for a paranoid dictatorship to protect. And in terms of sanctions, the result was that Iraq got pushed so hard towards sanctions that when Iraq's revelations were met by added UN scrutiny and distrust, <coughs> frustrated Iraqi leaders deepened their belief that inspections were politically motivated and would not lead to the end of sanctions. That is definitely not the place that we want to ever find ourselves in Iran, because then there's no deal to be had. Thank you very much, Scott. Well, uh, finally, Azadi. Um, well, I think everyone's done some really excellent scene setting um, about the possible doomsday scenarios, the more sort of um, optimistic historical scenarios, and a good sense of what the state of play with the diplomacy is right now. So I think what I'll try and add, um, add to the background before we go into our discussion is um, what the next year or the next few months really might hold for Iran-US relationships, uh, Iran-US relations, because this is really the relationship that is at the center of this entire nuclear issue um, in the sense of the Europeans having attempted to negotiate for the West for much of the past decade, that being unsuccessful, um, leading to endless sort of stalled process and, and not, a real, not a real process of negotiation. Um, so I think in the next few months, probably up until about March, we have a sort of window of opportunity. Um, and there is hints and we're seeing signs of the possibility of the US and Iran sitting down and having 
bilateral discussion about their sort of long history and issues that they face and potentially talking about reestablishing a relationship, which would potentially recast all of this in, in an entirely different light because this is the troubled relationship that has loomed over all of these negotiations. Um, so this is something that we're seeing signs of. There is now um, an open debate in Iran about not only talking to the US, but having a relationship with the US. This is very new. This is unprecedented to have this kind of conversation. So it's clear that Iranian <coughs> officials, at least, are trying to prepare their public for the possibility of maybe not reestablishing ties, but beginning a conversation with the US that would potentially redirect things. Um, uh, we're seeing signs of major senior officials, the head of the judiciary, the Ministry of Intelligence putting, floating a sort of policy paper saying that diplomacy is going to be what may avert war for Iran. Um, I think there is an understanding in Washington as well that the absence of these talks has really led to um, a failure of the P5 plus one track really achieving very much. Um, and there is, so there seems to be an indication in Washington that there's um, an openness to the idea of sitting down for a bilateral discussion. Um, I think that could be transformative, and I think that the, the reason why the next few months is, a, is an important window is because Iran in March will shut down for its New Year holiday, then it goes into its election cycle for the summer elections. Uh, this is an important window for Obama as well. Um, he's won the election, he's got a few months of an open hand before we go into the midterm congressional election cycle. Um, and the American domestic sort of congressional agenda takes over. So I think this is going to be key, and the question of whether Iran and the US can sit down apart from this track and have an adult discussion about their issues may recast actually this whole question in another light. Um, I think it's very interesting about the role that sanctions have played. I think we might be able to talk about have, um, have they been effective in slowing Iran's push towards um, at least uh, acquiring the capability to acquire a weapon. Have they backed uh, Ayatollah Khamenei into a corner? At least he's now seeming as though he's got to make um, a decision. Is he going to go the route of Pakistan and hope that acquiring a weapon will give the country a cloak of immunity? Or um, will we have to make a nuclear compromise? I think what's clear is that the status quo or Iran's ambition, which has been to say just a sort of screwdriver turn away from weaponization, is not going to endure. Um, so I think the year, um, the year will be an important one for Iran, certainly, in, in all sorts of different ways. Um, but the next few months, potentially, also for this whole track with the P5 plus, uh, the P5 plus one in the West. Well, thank you very, very much, all four. And I want to pick up a few of the, uh, the points, but, uh, but perhaps I could take advantage of the chair and say a couple of things that, that come to mind as a result of listening to, to you. Um, the first is that, of course, the open hand of friendship that was extended by Obama in Cairo now three years ago um, was never followed by either a wrist, an elbow, or, or even a shoulder. And the big question is whether indeed Obama has a wrist, an arm, or a shoulder. Uh, if he does, this will be the great test, and I agree very strongly with you on that. But the other thing is this, that um, I mean, the last time I was in Tehran, which was about uh, 16 months ago, I asked Mr. Jalili, the um, negotiator, um, you know, who they were really most concerned about. Now, this was before this current immediate spat. But I said, is it Tel Aviv or is it Washington? And he said, it isn't either. It's actually Pakistan. Uh, we are extremely concerned that uh, Wahhabi hotheads will get hold of the nuclear weapons. And rest assured, it won't be Washington or Tel Aviv they'll be interested in. It'll be us. It'll be terror. <coughs> and uh, that had a resonance for me. And it's something I don't think that people looking in from the West really perceive at all. And, and I actually think it's been exacerbated by what had most clearly been the very strong seeds of a Sunni-Shia war, which nobody's really talked about, um, in which there is a, clearly a very considerable interest in <coughs> Saudi arenas uh, to see the Iranians off. And seeing <coughs> the Iranians off is expressed in the war in Syria, which has huge Saudi involvement and backing. So uh, I think that's a dynamic I hope we can explore, and particularly 
because you have a bit of an axis there. Um, and then finally, um, I do really like what you said, because I think any dispassionate hack who has worked in Israel, worked in Iran, worked generally in the region, cannot escape the reality that actually natural allies are actually Iran and Israel and India, the three eyes. The Indians have a very strong relationship with Iran. They have a very strong relationship with Israel. And the three of them have a very considerable interest in some kind of an axis which will counterbalance the strength of the Arab coalition that exists on the other side. So I don't think it's out of the question. I think the last issue, the big problem, is that the leadership of Iran is horribly splintered at the moment. Ahmadinejad is politically dead, completely dead, absolutely powerless. <coughs> Mashoy, who might have followed him, is also dead. I mean, I'm only speaking sort of, he's not actually dead, but he's politically dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I think that the, the, the difficulty is that power is now back in the hands of Hamini in absolutely no uncertain terms. And the Supreme Leader has always been in charge, but never actually been kind of running the buses. Uh, but, but, but his agents, who the Marajanis and the others, are now basically the people running the country. And the worry is that whatever the election throws up, it may not throw up a political leadership with whom America can do business. It's very unlikely, I think, that the Supreme Leader will ever do direct business with America. Um, and, and his agents would have to do the business. And how much freedom they would have, I don't know. That's worth discussing. So I, I'm wondering who the Americans would talk to, uh, whether you're really confident that an, an election, and they've been pretty successful in throwing up people to talk to, Rafsanjani, Hatami, um, you know, not, not that Rafsanjani ever became president, but, but, but they've been successful in throwing up people that people can talk to. Do, are you confident that an election will throw up somebody who, who has the power to talk or has power slid back into the hands um, of the Supreme Leader? Um, well, I think that the contenders that we're seeing emerge ahead of this election um, do, do suggest that, um, at least in one instance, there would be a key candidate who would be, an, who is the Velayati, and he's an advisor um, to the Supreme Leader, is a very trusted, long-time advisor, specifically in foreign policy. Um, and that candidacy, I'm sure, would be looked upon very favorably, and that would sort of move <coughs> Iran past the kind of factional infighting that has been paralyzing the establishment for the past few years. It would put someone in the presidency that would be working basically in tandem with Khamenei. Um, and would and someone who has known the Americans <coughs> the Americans have known. Yes, been foreign yes, minister. and this is, this is the name that, that comes up when rumors get, get spread uh, recently about back channel, back channel um, communication, this Belaya team. Um, so to have someone that would have that kind of relationship with Khamenei would mean that, at least from the perspective of Washington, this is someone they can do business with because they would have the confidence that he is empowered by Khamenei to negotiate. Um, there are other contenders who don't have that, that sort of relationship. There's uh, Ali Bof, who's uh, talked about very favorably. He's popular. Um, he would probably have a better chance at, at getting a popular vote. And it's very important for the Iranian government, uh, for the Iranian regime, to have good turnout in this election, to sort of erase the, the taint, the blood taint of 2009. Um, so there are other calculations also at work. Um, but again, he has a good re uh, relationship with the Revolutionary Guard, and it would not be sort of Ahmadinejad scenario in which the presidency is at war with the leader's office and confusing the world. Very handy. Just, uh, um, it's very important to note that when it comes to the nuclear power, the nuclear program decision making, it's the supreme leader who makes the decision. Uh, and y when you want to look at who <coughs> deals with that, this is, this, is, uh, this is representative. So Mr. Jalili, who you spoke to, that's a far more important person to look at than, than the presidential candidates and his relationship between, uh, with, with Ayatollah Khamenei. In terms of the Iranian elections in, 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 2000, uh, in 2013, I think it's not going to be election, it's going to be far more a selection. I think it's going to be Ayatollah Khamenei's choice of who is going to become president. I don't think the people of Iran are really going to have a choice in the matter. I think it's not going to be like 2005 or even 2009 when some of the reformers were allowed to run. I think Ayatollah Khamenei is feeling more uh, um, is insecure about the regime, so it's going to be very important to pick somebody who is close to him. Look at Mr. Ahmadinejad. He brought him up from nowhere, and he <laughs> bit the hand that fed, basically. And I think that's left a mark for Khamenei. 
And I think he's going to pick somebody who is not going, you know, who, who will work with him as, as a loyal soldier. Well, that would provoke a lot of trouble on the streets, wouldn't it? Um, if there I were no candidate that, that the streets could vote for. To be honest with you, I think that the, what the people of Iran want is not right now the priority of, of the Iranian regime. I think they'll try to make sure that the street is controlled. If the people of Iran really wanted to provoke the streets, if they could, they want to, Mr. Musavi and Mr. Karubi would not be under house arrest right now. I think the people, if there was election, let's just say a scenario of 2009, at least the, the reformists would win much more votes. Mm. But I think the, imp so the important thing is to watch out for is the mm. only thing that the Iranian presidential elections in 2013 will tell us is where is Khamenei looking at? What direction is it going to lead the country? Which whoever person he picks as the president will tell us where he's going to take the country. There's another candidate, Mr. Haddad Adel, whose relatives, uh, Mr. Adel's uh, daughter, is, is married to Ahmadinejad's son, Mujtaba, who could be his successor. If he's picked, then I think that would just say that Khamenei is just completely taking over the country <coughs> because Mr. Haddad Adel has got no charisma or influence. <coughs> you know, this, well, just, just on, on uh, the points that they're making about the, uh, about the presidency, you know, if Veli Ati actually is a candidate, he probably won't get too many votes either because he doesn't have an awful lot of charisma. So he's not likely to become the choice ultimately. But he can still play the role because the Americans know very much that he is invested in that power you know, with Khamenei. And in terms of, of the vote for 2013, as Mayor says, an important element is going to be the turnout, which may help the leader decide who he wants. Kalabakh is a very, very popular mayor of Tehran. He's also demonstrated a, a willingness to, to show himself as a top gun you know, kind of pilot, which is what he did. He flies uh, um, uh, Airbus aircraft and that sort of thing in the last campaign that he ran. He looked very, very uh, much like that. But in any event, that would be the kind of person that would potentially be a bridge candidate to get more people to vote. Out of Barry Afran, you took the pin out of the grenade. Everybody else put it back in again, and is talking about elections. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm surprised, actually. I thought we were talking about Iran and Israel, not about the internal affairs of Iran. So, well, I, I'm now going to talk about the internal <laughs> affairs. Seriously, of, I'm now going to talk about the internal affairs of Israel. But I thought yeah. I'd let you comment on what's just happened. No, what I want to say, actually, uh, it is not the problem of America and Iran. It is the problem of Israel. Who is actually banging the drums of war against Iran? Who is actually, who bombed the Iraqi nuclear plants in 1981? Who bombed the nuclear Syrian, so-called uh, um, Syrian plants, nuclear plants, and there is Zur in the you know, north east of uh, Syria? So it is Israel. But Israel, but Israel but actually, with we, respect, have, we have, we have respect, to talk about those, that. Both those targets and, were you know, here, totally soft by comparison with Iran. Yes. I mean, Iran, you would accept, is an altogether different matter from Definitely. the two sites That's, you identify. You did not let me complete, actually, what I want to say. You know, if the Israeli decided to ignite a war in the Middle East, it will be devastating. The whole region will be destroyed. The oil fields actually will be bombed. The prices of oil may reach 300, maybe, uh, you know, $400 a barrel. The uh, thousands and thousands of people will be killed. Uh, so th this, is, this is what we should look at now. But the aren't, you, who is, aren't you who is precisely pressure? identifying why nobody will bomb Iran? Yeah, but if, if you have somebody like Netanyahu is actually all the time saying well, we have to bomb Iran, bomb Iran, bomb Iran, bomb Iran, bomb Iran. So we are yeah. not saying, you know, we should bomb Iran. The Arabs mm. are not saying that. The Israeli who are actually trying to put pressure <laughs> on the United States to actually bomb the Iranian. Though actually the Arabs you know, look at the sanction. Be upset. We, we, talk, that. we talked about the <laughs> sanction <laughs> here. Let me, let me say something. Nobody mentioned the Iranian people. You know, when, when, the, when Iran actually losing about 40% of oil export, when actually the, the, the Iranian real losing about 80% of its value, when the people of Iran are starving because of this sanction, why when nobody is talking about? And why the Iranian under sanction? Israel got nuclear bombs. Israel got 200 but warheads, do, nuclear warheads. Why we can't impose sanction against the Israeli? Can why, I go, why? Well, just a moment. Before, yeah. before we, get, we, we, we go to the Israeli quadrant and have a look at Netanyahu, do I hear the Arabs talking about the pain the Iranians are suffering? No, they don't give a damn. No, They're we do. Shears. No, we you do. You become completely... You know, I am an Arab. I'm saying it here now. No, but the, the Arabs of the Gulf... You guys must... Excuse me. 
You guys were helping Saddam Hussein when he was bombing my friends and my family and my compatriots in Iran. Who's that? The Arab street, the Arab countries. Which I didn't Arabs? see one Which Palestinian Arabs? Arabs? fighting. I didn't see one Palestinian coming to the aid of the Iranian people when Saddam Hussein was bombing Tehran. So I think, you know, it's both sides also. Uh, in terms who, of... Uh, who was behind Saddam Hussein when he bombed Iran? Well, America. It wasn't Israel, was it? It's well, America. <laughs> it's not, well, I'm and Israel indirectly. If I can... Uh, indirectly. <laughs> can I? You know, sitting, sitting here in London, and I'm speaking as an ex-Londoner, I lived here for 15 years, I'm very grateful for Mr. Atwan for not blaming Israel for one thing, and that's British Rail. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Atwan, because I think that would be unforgivable. British Rail is well, doing well, very well nowadays, you know. <laughs> I, well, not from what I hear from my friends in London, but um, seriously here, um, Mr. Atwan is from Gaza, and you know, his, uh, his, his home is from Gaza, and, and he's my neighbor. Um, I want peace with the Palestinian people. Um, these are my cousins, these are the people. Israel's security, you know what? We can beat the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime doesn't scare me. If these guys, if the Palestinian people don't have a state, that is an existential threat to the security of the state of Israel. The Iranian regime, the world is with, the world Look at the sanctions. Look at how China and Russia are against Iran today. The world, when it comes to Israel, not wanting the Iranian regime to have a nuclear weapon, we are supported. But the world is not with us when Mr. Netanyahu decides to make all these settlements and everything else that's going on. Mr. Atwan, the reason why the people of Israel don't want the Iranian regime to have a nuclear weapon is not because we don't want anybody else in the region to have nuclear weapons. You know, when Israel was designing the Jericho missile with Iranian money, during the time of the Shah, they told him that one day when you get this missile from us, if you want to put some unconventional warheads on top of that missile that we're going to give you, you have that option. It's not, it's not because we don't want the Iranians to have nuclear weapons. It's because them. of this regime. It's because of this regime, and I tell you why. I tell you why. We and you, Israelis and Palestinians, yes, we have a war. You have suffered, we have suffered, you've suffered greatly. I don't have a doubt. The Iranian regime has called for Israel to be eliminated time and time again. The Iranian regime has denied the Holocaust. We call the germ, we call the cancer. But you could just say, well, this is just rhetoric. Why take it seriously? Well, the Iranian regime has put its hatred into action. We saw in the Second Intifada, 700 Israelis were killed by suicide bombings paid by Iranian money, half of it at least. The other half came from Saudi Arabia. 700 dead Israelis, let's just say, the money for 350 of them came from but Iran. But how many Palestinians? Hang on, the, I, I condemn it completely, but I'm just talking <laughs> about why the Israelis see it. 350 dead Israelis financed by Iran. If you compare that equivalent to the pro, uh, population of Israel to the UK, that would be about 1,800 dead Britons on the buses of Manchester and London. If a regime would have said the same things about the United Kingdom and would have financed the death of your citizens, in the name of, let's just say, supporting the Irish nationalism, you would not want that regime but, to have a nuclear weapon me, can, either. Can we come back to the question of what's going to happen in Israel exactly. immediately? It's not going there, to be a war. Is, well, no. Netanyahu can't build yeah. 3,000 no, no. homes without you however, know, the world against us. However, He's going to attack Iran. However, there is going to be an election. <laughs> and what is going to happen in the election? Mr. Olmert was screwed, obviously, by uh, the moment, the timing of the, of, of the Gaza invasion. So he's out of it. Netanyahu has a clear run? Look, Netanyahu has a clear run, but in Israel, if you look at the polls, 75% of Israelis are against the unilateral attack against Iran. We have, you know, we had a, um, a little in Israeli intifada, if I can put it that way, when we had the former head of the Mossad, Mr. Meir Dagan. <coughs> we had the former head of the, 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 the domestic intelligence, Mr. Yuval Diskin, coming out against it, we have, against attacking Iran. We have Mr. President Perez, we have Mr. Olmert. We have the current chief of the IDF. We have the chief mm. of the IDF, Mr. Benny Gantz, saying that Iran has not made a decision to make a bomb yet. When you put all these things together, Mr. Netanyahu on Iran is very isolated. But he's not isolated in terms of getting re-elected. Exactly. He's not, but, but, but the election is not about Iran. Although Mr. Netanyahu would like it to be, it's yeah. not going to be about Iran. And, and the other thing also about but saying... He's going to be re-elected. He's going to be re-elected. And what happens the, then? Um, well, there's going to be more settlements, there's going to be uh, more isolation of Israel, but it's not going to be because of Iran, it's because of going to be what's going to happen with the Palestinians. So, 
I mean, that, 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 that looks very clearly from, from what he's saying, and, and I think there's evidence to support, certainly those voices that he identifies are true, that, that they do not support having a bombing campaign against Iran. You get Netanyahu re-elected, but you don't necessarily get a war. You know, first, the, all of them are ex-generals. They are not in power. They don't have any post in the government. They don't have in the smaller government which take the decision of war. Who, you know, we know in Israel, there are about nine ministers who decide the strategic things. And Netanyahu based his actually election campaign on the Iranian threats. For the last three or four years, he was concentrating all the time that Iran is the threats. And even when the, when the last so why war didn't Gaza, he attack? Let, let, me, let me complete. Hmm. The last war in Gaza, he used the Palestinian as a guinea pigs in order to test the Iranian missiles, in order to see how effective these missiles, which Hamas, which is you know maybe a fifth class missiles, well, I don't believe the Iranian will give Hamas and Al Jihad the most sophisticated one. So uh, we are dealing with a, a, a right wing coalition which is very very radical, and this coalition, Lieberman and Netanyahu and sass with them, and the others, they would like actually to ignite a war in the Middle East. They cannot, Netanyahu actually is looking for a war. And he's saying publicly, he went to the United States in order to mobilize the, the Congress against Iran, and also to, to strengthen the sanction against them. Well, I, but our Israeli one. analyst is saying he can seek, but he's not Mr. actually Adwan, finding. In 2010. But, you know, are, we, are we going to wait until Netanyahu Mr. takes Mr. the decision Adwan. and attack Iran? I think, you know, Mr. Netanyahu should hire you as, his, uh, as part of his election campaign because you give him so much power and credibility that he doesn't get in Israel. He, in, according to a documentary in Israel, Channel 2, Ovda, which called The Fact, in 2010 he ordered the IDF to go on a state of alert that would basically tell the Iranians, make them scared into thinking we're about to attack them so that they would attack. And according to that documentary, the head of the Mossad and the head of the IDF told him, no, we're not going to do this because this is going to counter against, you know, okay. this is going well, to start I'm, a I'm change. So he, I'm gonna be he can't but wake he up one day and start a war. I, I'm going to be brutal and, okay. and suggest that the majority on this panel believe there is not going to be a bomb attack on Iran. Now, we'll keep your minority view very much alive because I'm sure it'll be engaged with it. But one of the things I'd like to do is just to take a quick show of hands as to how many people here believe there is going to be an attack on Iran led by Israel, America, or anybody else who cares. Care, we should say mention. unilateral. I think that'll be much, much more clear. Unilateral Israeli unilateral attack. Unilateral Israeli attack. All right, unilateral Israeli attack. How many people believe? Uh, well, <laughs> within the, within, well, I'm happy to say that within the next two years, hands up those that think there will be a unilateral attack by Israel in the next two years. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny minority of the people. The American here. and Israeli. That this is not a scientific. <laughs> this, is not a, yep. this is not a scientific <laughs> test. Yeah, but so let us just say move. The American, move, American, no. British, and uh, Israeli attack against. Let the me Europe. move then. <laughs> And, and the I, British Rail. Yeah, I want to pick up. Therefore, <laughs> we'll give the, just I, give the Iranians British Rail running system. I want for to pick up program. therefore where Azadi left off because I think that that in the end is the most intriguing aspect. Mm. Is a new Obama regime going to try to make Iran its China, Nixon's China? Is that is that a serious possibility, or are the ingredients in Iran too dissipated? for them to engage. What's your? I think that for Iran, rebuilding ties with the US or smooth, smoothing this out is the top <coughs> geopolitical priority of the country. I think for the Obama administration, Iran comes a few rungs down the list. I think the Obama administration has major battles. Um, it's got fiscal problems. It's got, it's got a much wider agenda. I think Iran falls five or six sort of down the list. Um, but top foreign policy, why not? I think it would be, if it weren't such an intense battle with Congress, I think it would be. But I think it is, I think it is an ambitious foreign policy objective that meets with major congressional um, opposition. But and it is his ambition. I think it is an ambition, but I think that the administration has used it realistically. And I don't know if there's the political will in Washington to go to bat. Iran. How do you read the people who've all swung in behind America in ostracizing Iran? I mean, the European Union, I mean, basically, everybody's swung in behind 
And there is nobody you can really count on. Possibly the Germans are the most engaged <coughs> in trade, but it's hard really to find anybody who is sticking their neck above the parapet and saying, you're wrong, engagement is the, is, is the way we need to go. Well, I think that... Who are the allies who are going to come in behind America in engagement? Well, even the traditional allies, I mean, even the traditional Western moderates like Canada, perhaps, and Germany, who are not so to the right, like countries like France, are moving more to the right, unfortunately. Um, I think that Iran has really exhausted the West's patience at the negotiating mm. table the last decade, and it has sort of squandered the goodwill of those countries that were willing to, to push for diplomacy. Do you think the British have burnt their boats? Here's a country that's had 400 years of diplomatic relations <coughs> with Iran. Uh, still houses the Saras Cylinder, although it's going on tour in America, as these things do, um, and, and, and <coughs> has still lots of diplomatic expertise, and yet has managed to find itself disconnected diplomatically. Well, I think now that um, without, without an embassy, without diplomatic staff on the ground, I think the sort of British expertise that has really, that really t had Britain at the forefront of diplomacy for the last few years, I think that expertise will go stale, and it does mm. go stale very quickly. Iran is a very fluid political establishment. Things change, and I think that Britain's lost that role. One of the things I think uh, it's interesting when you mentioned the China example is that one of the decisions that, that President Nixon made before, you know, it, as part of this package was he basically ordered American intelligence agencies to stop their covert activities that were aimed at undermining China. And early on in the Obama administration, this apparently became an issue, I mean, literally just within the first weeks. Because, of course, the, the U.S. intelligence agencies, along with everybody else, had heard Obama speaking about reaching out to Iran and willing, you know, being willing to negotiate with, uh, with the Iranian president. And apparently, as, as has been reported, um, U.S. intelligence chiefs went to him very early on and said, sir, we think that we have been making some progress uh, with these clandestine operations that we've been doing, and so you know, we would like you to continue doing them. So at that moment, Obama had a choice, and his choice was to either completely go with a diplomatic effort and, you know, and basically reach out and cancel those covert operations, which of course the Iranians, if no one else can see them, because of course they're mostly covert, but you know, the Iranians certainly feel and know that those things are happening. So this is gonna be a test of, of seriousness. Or he could continue with those operations while at the same time holding out his hand. Now, Apparently, the way the decision went was that he made the decision that he could do both, that he would both be able to reach out and then continue also with the clandestine, um, with the clandestine operations because what, what he calculated, and apparently what he said, was that this would enable more time for negotiations, and therefore that would be a good thing. Of course, the reaction on the Iranian side, was, it was extraordinary because the first real reach when, when Obama really did say, you know, and, and made his first, uh, the, the Norus, the first uh, Persian New Year speech. And of course, this is prior to the 2009 elections. Things were looking good. It also looked like we had probably three or four years to play with um, because the elections in Iran hadn't happened and hadn't kind of messed things up. So the Supreme Leader very uncharacteristically responded the next day during his speech in Mashhad. And of course, it was a whole litany of all the problems that had gone on you know, between Iran and the US. And it, you know, it sounded very bad. But then down at the very bottom, there were just a few lines in which he said, if you change, we will change too. And this, you know, for those of us who you know, kind of read the tea leaves in Iran, was a pretty key moment um, for things happening. Mm -hmm. However, the qualification that the Supreme Leader came out with was that you know, if, if uh, the president reaches out his hand, it better be a genuine hand and not you know, an iron fist that's covered by a velvet glove. Of course, it was done much more eloquently than that. But the point is, is the Iranian perspective today, when there's a covert war that's underway, when you've got Iranian nuclear scientists who've been assassinated in the streets, when you've got computer viruses which are being used, when you've got unexplained um, explosions that have been going on, when you've also got a kind of espionage that literally includes things like, like removing street signs and replacing them with street signs in Tehran that have you know, that can sniff for, you know, for nuclear materials in certain locations. I mean, this is, these are the kind of things that the Iranians know and feel and allow them to then say, the Americans aren't serious and therefore why should we can do I, it? I well, I, I have to say that the, one of the things which, which, which I've detected in, in the years since the revolution is the yearning in Iran for respect. Nobody has ever come from the United States in the last 30 years 
and said, we respect this country, we respect the civilization, the 6,000 years, the alphabet, the maths, the rest, you know? And that is a matter of Persian pride. It's one of the things which coheses Iran in a ridiculous way. I mean, I think there would be much more dissent if America would actually recognize Iran, possibly even offer diplomatic relations. In fact, of course, there's never been. I mean, you've had John Kerry, but if that's as good as it gets, I mean, it's a sad old thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but I mean, there's, they've never sent a really senior American on behalf of the president to negotiate. And backroom stuff, although you've talked very eloquently about it, there must come a moment when eventually you say, we're going to take a risk. We're going to send somebody there. We're going to respect the country. We're going to state our respect for the country. And we're going to say we want to start a new chapter. And if it's in public, that's probably going to embarrass the regime very much more than almost anything else. Can I just add something? Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, Scott said about sanctions have not made any change. Um, they have made a change. There's two changes. Number one, before the sanctions started, every time the P5 plus one and Iran met, the Iranians flat out refused to talk about the nuclear program. They wanted to talk about how to manage the world in a just way, how to end poverty, how to end the, you know, the win the war on drugs, but they flat out refused to talk about the nuclear program. After the sanctions, miraculously, they want to talk about the nuclear program. It's on the table. So that's one tangible result. The other is that, as you said uh, quite rightly, there's now the talk of bilateral. Um, the, the, the Iranians are supporting um, uh, talks with the United States, whereas before they were against it. And John, if I may be so bold as to contradict you. Do, um, I need it. There have, been, there have been in 2004, George Bush, whatever, you know, he had a lot of faults. He sent out an offer, he sent a message to the Iranians mm -hmm. and the Iranians have confirmed it. Mr. Rouhani, the chief, uh, former chief uh, nuclear negotiator said that America, George Bush sent a message to us, said send me one of your representatives. I'm willing to talk to you about everything in Washington and the Iranian regime refused. This is after the uh, Americans refused the Iranian uh, facts, the uh, agenda for talks ah, in 2000. That's a rather <coughs> different proposition from the one I was suggesting. Okay, Asking an Iranian to go to Washington is a different but, story okay, from but, sending Washington to Iran. But another, or, but another, but how can you send somebody to Iran when all these years the Iranians have flat out refused to hold bilateral talks with the Americans over the nuclear program? I mean, but, Scott but, but, goes all these why, nuclear... why, can, why have a relationship which is founded on the nuclear program? Why not have a relationship which is actually founded on mutual respect? But I think the American, Mr. Pre president Obama, on balance, no other U.S. president on balance has tried as hard as President Obama. He recognized the Iranian regime. He said in his Nowruz message, the people, the leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran. So that's one step forward. He dropped the the, um, the precondition for suspension of uranium enrichment for talks because Bush had said that, that's another step forward. He sent a message to the people of Iran of their great civilization and the great history. And what did he get? I'm sorry, Scott. No, no. To get a speech in Mashhad where he lambasts the American for half an hour, and then at the last minute he says, well, you've taken a step towards me. I've just condemned you for it. But if you change, then maybe I'll be interested in talking yeah, but to let you. Me, let me I'm say sorry, something. that's not, that's not yeah, much of a signal. You know, that's just, not much of a signal. Yeah, the problem I is... I want to say, can I say two things very quickly about <laughs> sanctions? And because I think that they're a problematic tool of diplomacy, and I'm skeptical about their long-term uh, potential to work in this situation. One is, for these American sanctions, they're like a car without brakes. They're like all of these pieces stacked on top. You can't move <coughs> one without the other. If the regime in Tehran fell tomorrow, how long would it take the US to dismantle all of these sanctions? It would take probably two years. So this is not something that you can move around and apply and then sort of ease the pressure. It's a blunt instrument and it actually retards diplomacy. It's going to be a problem at all of these negotiations mm. if they happen. The second is, what are Iranians suffering? I'm not going to be over dramatic and make it sound like Baghdad in 2002. Iran is not at that point, you know, there's not malnutrition. We're not there yet. But it is becoming impossible to be middle class anymore in Iran. We are, this is the slow dying of the Iranian middle class. And I think that there's, obviously, I mean, it sounds a bit uh, sort of naive to raise the topic of eth <coughs> what, what is ethical, but I mean, mass punishment to the point where we are moving towards a, something that we have to talk about. Do we want to impoverish another major Middle Eastern middle class the way which, we've done? Which raises the question about what is actually the root 
policy yeah, in the United States, which isn't clear, because, right. Mayor, you're absolutely right that those things Obama has done, no question. But if you actually ask American diplomats, as I often do over the last several years, I ask them, please list for me the three most important elements, the, the three most important signals that you in Washington have given to the regime in Tehran to say that regime change is not your policy. Only the three most important ones. There's only one that they can ever say, and that is that there's two sentences saying we're not interested in regime but change. But Hillary Clinton no just said it two weeks ago that we're not interested in regime change. What are they doing in terms of the yeah. 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 Uh, Abdul, you know, you, 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 you come in, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor. You know, the Americans are well known in the Middle East of two things. <laughs> Deposing regimes and fintech fried chicken. That's, you know, if you ask any Middle Eastern people, say the American interested in deposing regimes in the Middle East. Since 1979, when the Iranian, when the Khomeini revolution started, and the American are working to change the regime in Iran. That's a fact. Since 1979, they frozen about $12 billion, and they imposed the sanctions, and they never established a relation with the regime there because they don't like Islamic regime in Iran. This one point. Second Why? point. Why? Let, let me ask them, ask me. You know, <laughs> do, do I impose a sanction against think? the Iranian? It's unbelievable. Why do you think? Ask, ask your, your prime minister why. Anyway, so the second one, the second one, you know, we are forgetting the strategic aims of the superpower in the Middle East. China, in four years' time, it will overtake America as the strongest economy in the world, after four years. And the American actually, they don't want the Chinese to put their hands, the Chinese and the Russian, to put their hands on the oil tap in the, of the Middle East. This is very, very important things. And they don't want any regional superpower to possess nuclear weapons or mass, weapon of mass destruction in order to threaten the American domination of the oil fields in the Gulf. That's, that's, that's facts. So Saddam Hussein tried to do so, and he paid very heavy price. His regime deposed. The Iranians are repeating the same mistakes in the eyes of the Israeli and the American. And so it is, it is extremely important to think about these kind of things. If during the Shah time, he was the closest ally of the, of, of the American. So why the American want to change him? So, but now they want to change the regime. They are, you know, the Americans are actually thirsty or hungry of changing regime in the Middle East. They want to change everything in the Middle East. But this time, it could be extremely difficult. If the Israeli know very well that it will be a picnic to attack the Iranian, I think they would do it a long time ago, because they did it in Syria when they destroyed their nuclear bomb, nuclear uh, plants, so-called fabricated nuclear plants. They did it to the Iraqis. So this is, this is the problem we are facing. The American wanted to change the regime of, the, of, of Iraq. About the middle class, they destroyed the middle class in Iraq. And they are destroying the middle class in, in Iran. And they are destroying the middle class in Syria now, indirectly or indirectly. They don't want middle class in the Middle East. They want either poor people, peasants, or actually Al-Qaeda uh, rebels. They don't want middle class in order to have democracy in our parts of the world. That's the problem. Where is the middle class of Iraq? Well, let, Where let, is the middle class of let, Syria? Let, Where is the middle class mm. of Iran? It well, is destroyed. Let, so, let's leave that rhetorical question in the The middle in the class air. of Saudi Arabia and, is shopping and, here and, in and, Harrods right and now. Come, Don't worry. To, come to the floor. <laughs> Who would like to start the ball rolling? Uh, you've been very persistent, so I'm going to go to you, yes. Uh, do we have mics? Yes. Um, if you just put your hand up, because so the mic does make to you. Uh, it's here um, in blue with a nice scarf. There we are. And let's just see who else has gone so we can get some mics around. Yes, get a mic over there, please. And then if you could look at this one next afterwards, this one behind you. Right. OK, let's go for it. Yes, I, I think in uh, talking about Iran and the Iranian regime, we forget to say that uh, the Iranian regime is not uh, one uh, entity. It is part, partly different types, you know, different groups in it. So when we are talking about Iranian regime making decisions, it's very difficult to see what faction of the Iranian regime is making decisions. Because we have factions within the Revolutionary Guards, we have factions within uh, Khamenei himself, we have faction uh, of, um, uh, going after Ahmadinejad's faction. So it's very complicated. It's not that easy We say, who is going to talk to Iran? To which faction are we talking about? Secondly, the ultimate uh, power by the Constitution or by uh, decrees is with the Khamenei. 
So he has to make the ultimate decision, either appoint <coughs> the next president or discussion with America. So it's very difficult. Um, as with uh, negotiations and having relations with America, don't forget that since the beginning of the Iranian Revolution, one motto of, or one distinction that this regime had with any other regimes maybe in the world was it's, uh, uh, it's, it's being against America. Just, it was like a slogan that they repeated it. Magba Carta, yeah. that was what was said. Magba, yeah. Magba yeah. Carta. Exactly. Yeah. Not Magna Carta, but Magba Carta. No. <laughs> yes. And not Cartier watches. Cartier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. So that, uh, the uh, other thing that uh, I wanted to say. A brief one, because there's a lot of other. Yeah. yeah. That Iran is not only the, you know, having war with or threatening uh, uh, Israel, Iran is meddling in other countries around. That's right. You know, so don't forget about that. They're meddling in Iraq, they're meddling in Afghanistan, they're meddling in other, other countries. So it is a very dangerous spot that we are talking about. Mm. And uh, going to war with Iran has consequences for the whole region as well. Thank you very much. I, I want to take the, the, the point here, please, next. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm an Iranian from the streets of Iran. Now, one thing that the West has really miscalculated from the beginning of the revolution is that first of all in, in its infancy, it did not allow it to grow. Whereas the left was destroyed in Iran, it was not allowed to take its course. We were lumbered with a war started by America through Saddam Hussein. Sec secondly, when we talk about nuclear weapons, who ha has nuclear weapons in the Middle East? Israel. Pakistan, India. I'm, I'm sorry, we have 6,000 years history where we have not fought, fought an aggressive war with any nation in the world. So how come we don't have the right to hold nuclear weapons? Okay, this country has got a terrible <coughs> regime. I'm not a fan of the Iranian regime. But as people of Iran, we cannot accept to be taught lessons that, you know, America is teaching us it was the first nation to drop a bomb on another country. It is not right to say to us that you are not civilized enough. You haven't got the culture, you haven't got the people, you haven't got the right to have a nuclear weapon or a nuclear establishment in your country. Thank you very much. And, and the final question of these three, and then we'll come to some more questions. Hi, I'm just wondering what role India can play um, in the diplomatic mix to break this deadlock. Um, India has nuclear, weapon, nuclear power with the US's blessing, and at the same time, as you said, it has close relationships with Israel and uh, Iran. So is there any way that they can be brought into uh, in the diplomatic circuit to either convince Iran to drop the bomb or to convince the West that the bomb is used for you know, peaceful ends? And my, just the other question is, do you think we'll see another green revolution? Well, two disparate but interesting <laughs> questions. Um, uh, on the Indian question, I, I mean, uh, I have been to India and interviewed people, including the foreign minister, about this question. Uh, they, of course, are completely dependent on Iranian oil. And it's a, just a fascinating uh, indication of Indian power that, in fact, the sanctions are completely meaningless. They, they, they go on importing oil of gay abandon. So they're in a strong position in terms of talking to the Iranians, I would argue. And their defense pact with uh, Israel is a fascinating one in which there is mutual defense development uh, pact, in which they, they, they share technology and, and a lot of, of other stuff. So certainly that influence exists. What I don't know, and I don't know whether you do, is whether there is actually any particular interest for India in, in, in playing any role in this. There's, to me, there's not much evidence that they have any interest in doing so. I, I think, um, as you quite rightly said, that they have good relations with both. Um, the, the Israeli government in 1996, when Netanyahu was, re was elected for the first time as prime minister, he tried to reach out to Iran, this is a famous article in Jerusalem Post, because Israel owes money to Iran because of some, uh, the, for oil prior to revolution. So Netanyahu it's, um, basically tell, told the Israelis to keep down all the, we, we don't want to get into a fight, we want to improve our relations with Iran. Maybe we've been saying, bad things about Iran, let's just quieten it down because we want to be able to see if we can reach some kind of an agreement with the Iranians in 96. Then of course in 96 we saw Hezbollah picked up the attacks and everything. 
I think the Israelis, they tried also during the Khatami to reach out to, to the Iranian government, but nothing happened. I think the Israeli government would love to have some kind of a talk with the Iranian government, even this government. Mm. But is the Iranian government ready to talk to the little Satan, because America is the big Satan? And these are not the name of rock bands, by the way. This is Little Satan and Great well, Satan is what we get. You know, that, that, that's an interesting answer on, on, on the Indian question. The Green Revolution, we'd be much better to turn to people within the audience here as to whether they think there is going to be a second coming of the Green Revolution than to ask the panel here, because I don't think any of us are necessarily equipped, uh, unless you are. Um, no, I could, I could weigh in on my thoughts about yeah, the, you weigh in. About the Green <laughs> Movement. Um, I mean, I would say that the Iranian opposition is dormant. I mean, I don't, I don't agree with people who describe it as dead and over and finished. Um, I think it suffers from a few major problems. One is that it's um, divided as to its aims. Is this a movement to um, overthrow this government and to bring about a completely different regime or to reform it peacefully from within? Um, there are major divisions on this question, and I think until that gets resolved, um, it will be very difficult to produce that same kind of momentum. Um, but I think that with social media keeping the debate alive between the Iranian diaspora, people who've been forced out since 2009, and civil society actors in Iran, I think that there is space for conversation, and Iran is famously unpredictable. So mm. we will see what the next election um, opens up by way of opportunity. And I will add that I think the Green Movement was not supported by the West. And I think that was a key factor in why it did not kick off the way that uh, the revolutions in the Arab world did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fascinating, thank Actually, you. Actually, there's, there's a point here. Uh, let let me just pick up the other questions that have, that have come up. Um, uh, well, I think your points, in a sense, are shared uh, to some extent by Abdul Bariat one, so I think we've kind of talked about the, um, the right to nuclear weapons. Yes. What about that? Well, actually, I don't know. Uh, I cannot understand why Europe in particular and the United States, as we know, why they are always, when the Iranians have a nuclear program, until now uh, they are saying it is for peaceful means, immediately sanctions, immediately, uh, you know, calling for wars against Iran. And uh, we in the Middle East, we say, okay, you don't want Iranian to have a nuclear bomb? Okay, that's all right. But let us actually uh, say to the Israeli, give up your nuclear uh, weapons. And in this case, in this case, we have a peaceful Middle East. You know, we, we wouldn't need a war <laughs> against the Iranian, and we can have peace treaties. <coughs> And it will, it, will, it will last, and everybody will be, will be happy. But to exclude the Israeli, they non signed the proliferation uh, treaties. They never actually opened the uh, Dimona uh, nuclear plants for any inspections. Uh, they, uh, so why would the Iranians are entitled to say, look, why you are against us? Why you are starving us? Because we, in, until now, we have uh, enrichment of uranium 20% only. While the Israeli have 300 or 400, God knows how many warheads, uh, nuclear warheads they have. Also, as you mentioned, our, our friend, Iran never invaded other people's countries. They, they never actually uh, did anything wrong to the Israelis. They never bombed the Israelis. They're Israel bombing uh, Gaza every day. You know, they, they don't, every day? They, they, enjoy, they enjoy bombing Gaza. Oh. And, you know, it, it seems like that. They bombed Lebanon. They, they are still occupying other people's territories. But what about the Iranians? They don't occupy uh, Israeli territories. They don't occupy other people's territories. They don't launch wars. So why we, are we scared from the Iranian nuclear, nuclear bombs, for example, or nuclear programs? That's the problem. What? It is hypocrisy here. Honestly, it is hypocrisy. We have to admit that. Seriously, why, why for the, this sanction? And you know, people, Iranian people are starving. Uh, you know, the chicken now is more they're than. Not uh, honestly, sorry, they are that's starving. Just the Iranian people they're are not starving, starving now. because of the sanctions. They lost this 40 percent of their incorrect. own revenues. They, right. you know, they cannot uh, let, let's export. Leave, they let's cannot leave, import. Let's leave the question of starvation. Unbelievable. Let's leave the question of starvation. Why? Because, you know, the Iranian let, are human beings. You know. Yes, let's leave the question of starvation in the air. And take another round of points from the floor. And number one is here. Uh, if you just keep your hand up, and then we'll have number two there, and number three up there, first one, and then number four at the back with the orange tie. So with the glasses and, and slightly less hair than me. Uh, there you are, yeah, that's it. Right, okay, good, good. That's diplomacy for you. Uh, no. Ma'am. Um, Professor Homa Khatizian from Oxford University in his um, relatively recent book, The Persians, he wrote, how Iran is a short-term society. You know, one day you are 
uh, a merchant, the next day you're a minister, the next day you're in prison, the next day you're dead. But then the next day your son might be the minister, who knows? Mm. And this has been ongoing since forever almost, before mm. the Iranian revolution, before the constitutional revolution. And I feel like as an Iranian Canadian, um, I feel like when you look at Iran's history, since the constitutional revolution, Iran has been trying to create a state, which in 1979, Khomeini changed a lot, but he maintained a lot of the institutions that had already been there. And he didn't impose a complete theocratic government. And the discussion about the nuclear weapons is, is it, does America want Iran to let go of its weapons or does it want regime change? And when you say regime change, what do you mean exactly? Are you talking about what's going on in Syria with death squads and bombs and you know that kind of thing, or are you talking about reform? Because I'm, I don't know, I, I'm, as an Iranian Canadian, I have to say, the Syrian situation, I know it won't happen in Iran, <coughs> but even something similar to that scares me. I think this is such an interesting question, we should take it in isolation. Mm -hmm. um, so, what does America want? Well, they didn't help the Green Movement, so they don't want regime change, because if they wanted regime change, they would have helped the Green, help, helped the green Movement. Like what they are doing in Syria. But they didn't help the Green Movement, because well, if I America agree, really wanted with, regime with respect, change... With if you have so little engagement with a country, your chances of influencing a Green Revolution are nil. I mean, here's a country with absolutely not a well. footstep in the place of any value. I mean, it's got spooks who are very good at wielding the Stutzik... Uh, and the computer virus and the rest of it, but they haven't got a creative foot in the place. I can't see how they could honestly have influenced. You know, America is not. The, America may not have an uh, embassy in Iran, but there are enough European allies of America. If they really wanted to channel money to these people in Iran, if they wanted to get the funds there or to, the, to get to their supporters abroad, how many TV channels does the Green Movement have abroad? Nothing. Does it have anything? Look at the Mujahideen Khal. Look at the monarchists. Mm -hmm. America didn't do it no, no, because if about, they were not about, interested in regime change. What about the American? What about the Iranian, American Iranian who have about 12 channels bombarding Iranian people during the revolution? And but the that's BBC, kind of, that's and the BBC a, also. What, the BBC is CIA now? <laughs> they, were, they were, you know... What, 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 what do you think? Because you look at this from, from several perspectives, not least also an American's perspective. Uh, what, what, what do you think America actually wants? I mean, I think that America would want, ultimately, a government in power in Iran that doesn't challenge its interests in the Middle East, which is very difficult to balance with a democratic Iran um, that would project its own ambitions for influence. So this is, I think, the crux, and it's very awkward. Isn't the difficulty that America lived with a poodle, a very handy poodle? One of the most depressing sights I used to see just before the revolution was to fly out of Mehrabad um, Airport and look down on the rows and rows and rows of jumbo, military jumbo jet troop carriers, uh, tankers, and fields full of armaments and the rest of it. And you said to yourself, what is all this for? And the Shah had bought it all. It was a fantastic kind of staging ground for a war that was never going to happen. No, what do what, you mean? I mean, and now you have a country... And when you wander around the people, you go to the university and these other things, you, when you spend time on the streets in Shiraz, in Tehran, in Esfahan, you meet young people who look west. This doesn't happen anywhere else in the region. These people look remorselessly west. They may be very devout. They, 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 they may go to the mosque and the rest of it. Actually, the thing about Shia Islam is it's incredibly like the Church of England. It's very, very <laughs> elastic. <laughs> It's the most. It's the only other. It's the only other truly elastic faith I've ever come across, um, and and I like it very much for that. I very rarely ever get woken up by the imam in the up there because they just don't. They don't get up at four o'clock in the morning. And, they're, 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 and 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 uh, you go around and you ask people. You you do, they want iPads. They want. You know that's why I've always said if you want to bomb Iran, bomb it with iPads and. Um, Mac Airs and the rest of it. You know, that's what people want. And they want videos, and they want video games, and they want life, and they want joy, and they want it the way we have it. Uh, and it isn't as if they crave a life on their knees. They don't crave the prayer mat. Uh, I mean, you know, they're, they're perfectly happy to have it and do it. And, and even, even head coverings, actually, you know, although 
of course, lots of people wear it in a very coquettish way and the rest of it, but nevertheless, I mean, <coughs> sorry, I've got carried away now, but I, did, <laughs> but, but I love <coughs> Iran. I love Iran. I mean, to be amongst the people in Iran is a most exciting and stimulating thing. There aren't countries in the region that it is so persistently uh, inspiring to be around. That's what's so extraordinary. So what do they want? No wonder they're frightened of it, because it's a very, very exciting country. But unfortunately, it, 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 it's got a sort of... Uh, I mean, I thought this was a very good question because it did describe the way, the, 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 down the years, Shah included, the, the, the regime has not been a success. I mean, it's constantly trying to reinvent itself and the rest of it, and, and it's, it's, it's not been a success. I don't know. But well, I, I think uh, you are American, so I mean... <laughs> no, no, just, no, no, but I think Azadeh makes an excellent point when she says that, that what the United States does not want is a regime that challenges its interests mm -hmm. in the region. And this is a very broad definition, but it's one that applies to Iran a lot. It's one that applied a decade ago to Saddam. I mean, how many arguments and you know, analysis was there saying that it's because that Saddam is sitting there doing this, even though we put on sanctions, all of these things, that you know, he must go because he's, you know, he's a threat or he's a problem or he just isn't doing what we want him to do. Well, of course, this regime in Iran does not do anything mm. that the United States wants it to do. It does not behave that way. It grumbles noisily. It shouts with beautiful, absolute... So would it like a sort of comfortable Saudi regime, for well, example? Well, exactly. Exactly. Probably. That's yes. exactly right. Yeah. But to give you an idea about the scale of the, of the uh, problem here, I, you know, after the, uh, after the remarkable uh, nuclear deal that was uh, negotiated with, with the Turks, the Brazilians, and the, and the Iranians, which was exactly the same deal that had been on the table some months earlier, um, that, the, um, that had been rejected, you know, first accepted by the Iranians and then later rejected. Um, it, was all, it was all a tangle, but it had failed. This is the nuclear fuel swap mm. deal that, uh, that was coming out. So finally, that was negotiated um, by the Turks, the Brazilians, and the, uh, and the Iranians. And our understanding, and I, I remember sitting at a press conference with uh, Ahmed Davatolu, who is the, the uh, Turkish uh, foreign minister, who was telling us, he said, we were in Tehran. This is like the next day they came back. He said, we were in Tehran. We were on the phone with Hillary Clinton in real time and with, you know, with the, the uh, head of the National Security Council, because they understood, the Turks understood, that if the deal wasn't accepted by the Americans, it was pointless. So, all that sounded great, and three hours after Davatolu told us that, three hours after that, Hillary Clinton gives her testimony to the Senate in which she says, our answer to this, to this Tehran Declaration is more sanctions. Now, sure. when I spoke to a couple months later, I spoke to a very senior American who was engaged and sitting at the table in Washington making a decision about that reaction, right? And it, the, the react, what she said was, in justification, was she said, we didn't want to give anything to the Iranians that they might consider a victory. Now, that's a lot to overcome. I think this is a great anecdote. Um, uh, or example that, that Scott brings in, because I think this is an important instance where the Turks really did put an important deal on the table, and the Americans walked away from that, essentially. And I think it illustrates the fact that um, their thinking in Washington at the time saw sanctions as very effective, mm -hmm. saw sanctions as putting a chokehold on the Iranian economy. Um, and they felt that, and I think that other journalists have also heard from other sources, the sanctions were working too well. They were, there, was, there was no willingness to sort of move away from that. There was an excitement in Washington, I think, that they were proving so effective. And that was more alluring than the possibility of a diplomatic resolution. And the Turks were furious, incidentally. Mm, absolutely. Can, can I just add something to that? Mm. I'm going to take, well, sorry, I just want to try and take the last three questions because, in fact, we're sort of over, overrunning. So I'm, <coughs> I'm going to take the last four because I'll take you in pink. So, that, yeah, that, that, but the first <coughs> one is up there. Yes, go for it. And then Thanks. down here, up there and down here. So four people, we're going to go right round quickly. No long questions, no long points, but pithy, sure. short, really interesting. Moments. Thanks, John. Uh, <laughs> I, I think when you said the man with less hair, the word you were looking for was, was bold but handsome. That's it, that's it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we were talking about the fragmented nature of uh, the power structure in Iran, and a Chinese friend of mine says that Iranians are, are just like their rice. They don't stick together. Uh, and so I want to extend that argument about the, this disunity and just take the panel's take on the Iranian diaspora. How do you see the, the makeup of the Iranian diaspora? 
And uh, when America plays a fantasy regime change, like it did with Ahmad Shalabi in Iraq, what kind of Ahmad Shalabis do you see out there for Iran? Good question. Diaspora, right. Next one. Move the microphone to the orange tie. Yeah, I'm curious uh, about the panelists' impression of people who are really shaping US policy. Uh, when they have conversations behind closed doors, if the topic, say, of like destruction of Iran's middle class were to come up, um, is this something when no one's listening um, that they actively want? And we can make the rhetoric about an unstable regime and what will they do with that nuclear weapon, but then is there really a more real motivation of sanctions go through middle class gets destroyed, potential global regional competitor gets crumbled and the game of global hegemony goes on with us as king. How much does that voice truly exist in the people who are shaping US policy? Very, very good question. Um, and orange tie. Yes, hello, it's a red tie. Red, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my name is uh, Nimrod. Mine's yellow. Yeah, my name is Nimrod, my fiance is Iranian. We are heavily in love. Mazal tov. <laughs> and the thing Mazal is she, Thanks. And she cannot move money from an Iranian bank account because it's blocked due to the sanctions, so I have to pay for the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> also, she recently went to the Imperial College London to study nuclear science, and they told her, no, you cannot study nuclear science without foreign office approval. It's not fair. So get her Israeli citizenship. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, and it's such an important point because actually there are businesses in the northwest of England in particular who suffer dreadfully because the widgets they make, which have nothing whatever to do with nuclear power or anything else, are now banned from export because of the sanctions and the rest of it. Um, and actually, it is actually it is costing British jobs to do this sort of ludicrous stuff. But anyway, uh, a, a good good point. We'll pick that up in a moment. And our final question is. The man in pink down here coming down, there's a microphone charging down with a sweater which I think becomes red as it comes near. That's it. I'd like to know what the panel thinks not about where Israel or the states stand vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian threat, but where do the other Arab states uh, stand on this? I mean, Mr. Atwan, was very vociferous in making it uh, and making it sound as if the Arabs don't mind Iran having nuclear power. I'm not quite sure that's true. I'd like to have the <laughs> panel's view on that. Very good question. So very really, uh, three <laughs> extremely interesting and one <coughs> anthropologically fascinating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, let, let's just start with the, 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 well, let's start with the last question. It oft, often helps. Um, you know, the Arab states are completely relaxed about Iran having a bomb. Well, actually, it depends which Arab you are talking about. <laughs> if you talk about the American Arabs, yes, they are with the Israeli in the same uh, camp. You know, they would like well, the Israeli the to bomb Iran. The, the Saudis, Saudis you know they, them very well. they would love to see the Israeli warplanes bombing Iran. Of course. Yeah, that's, that's and uh, Netanyahu mentioned that several times. Uh, but if you most people like to see no, that, no. Uh, you know, the Gulf states, how much, uh, you know, they represent less than 10% of the whole of the Arab populations. But if you look at the rest of the Arab world, you know, they don't want wars. You know, we had enough of wars in the Middle East. We have enough of deaths in the Middle East. We have enough of destruction in the Middle East. So this is, we cannot actually look at the American Arabs who would like to see, you know, who they follow the American policies in the Middle East. That's the problem we are facing. If the Americans say to them, we are going to bomb Saddam Hussein, said, okay, go bomb Saddam Hussein. If you want to change the regime in Syria, go and change the yeah, regime you know, in Syria. The nice if they want to change the regime in Libya, we ask you Libya, about Arabs and you're talking about Americans. I want to talk American about Arabs, Arabs right? <laughs> the the, Arabs, the yeah. question here is, well, how do Arabs feel about the whole idea of, of Iran having a nuclear weapon? They will say, you know, yes, they should have, as long as Israel put nuclear bombs, you know, the Iranians should now, have now nuclear bombs, your, the Saudis should have nuclear bombs, like the GNS. Now take your diplomatic hat off yeah. and tell us honestly, <laughs> most Arabs, okay. surely, are looking on and saying, well, that keeps them in the box. You know, look, what they are saying that, this is the American and European excuses, if the Iranian got nuclear bombs, 
we will have actually a nuclear arm race in the Middle East. Why not? You know, instead of the Saudi money, you know, is, is invested in the United States and Europe, it should be invested in also in, 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 uh, in nuclear programs. Why not? Egypt, why shouldn't Egypt, for example, which was threatened by the Israeli, why the Egyptians should not have nuclear bombs in order to have a deterrent against the Israeli? Wait, Look which, at which, which, which Egyptians would you give them? Your entire square. You've got one not here, one not here. Okay, they will, which ones they, you they will get together. To? When it comes to oh, Israel, they will okay, be united. Fine, fine. But I'll, I'll tell you just one thing, yeah. one thing. When Saddam Hussein lost his weapon of mass destruction, when he allowed the American and the European to destroy his weapon of mass destruction, what happened to him? His country was invaded, occupied, and he was hanged. So the Iranian, they are looking at what happened to Iraq, what happened to Saddam Hussein. Iraq is dismembered, it is divided, it is actually the one of the most corrupt country on earth, democracy is not working. So the Iranians are scared of the American Western intervention in Iraq, and All they right. can see the outcome, and they are entitled to have nuclear weapons right. in order to protect themselves. themselves. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Um, in terms of what, how the Arab feels about Iran, you know, recently there was the Gaza war, and in Egypt there was a popular revolution, there was democratic elections, there was the Morsi, whatever you want to say about him, he was democratically elected. Uh, Mr. Salehi, the Iranian foreign minister, said, I would like to visit Gaza, and this is Mr. Morsi, not Mubarak, Morsi, he told them you cannot, you're not allowed to go to Gaza because that is not in the interest of the, Iran, of the Palestinian people. So this is Egypt we're talking about. And let's not forget what's happened in Syria. The Iranian regime has been seen as sponsoring the death of 30,000 Sunnis in Arabs in, Sur in Syria. I don't think the image of Iran today, the Iranian regime, I don't mean the people, I don't think the image of the Iranian regime today is one where the Arab people would welcome this regime to have nuclear weapons. I don't see Iran today, anybody in the Arab world supporting the Iranian model. Why? Because the Arab Spring has been about everything that the Iranian regime is not about. The Arab Spring was about democracy, the Iranian regime is about dictatorship. The Arab Spring was about bringing justice and fighting corruption, the Iranian regime is becoming more and more corrupt every day. So I don't see the Arab people want seeing Iran as the protector of the Arab rights, when as we see, the Iranians have actually been helping Bashar al-Assad do all these awful things that he's been doing in Syria. If you really want, if you really want to isolate the Iranian regime and you want to help bring stability in the Middle East, please support the peace process between Israel and Palestine. Where this is, it? is the most important. Where is, is it? Not, this is why we need their support. Where is it? This is why we need their support. I'm just very quickly on that question about, um, about the Arabs. I'm going to quickly say, because I think it's important, um, the Gulf monarchies, specifically Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, have a vested interest in this kind of hostility towards Iran and the isolation of Iran, because they have, in the case of Bahrain, a restive population and opposition movement that's branded as Iranian. It's very convenient. Everyone who's um, democratically minded in the Gulf is Iranian. So I think that this is the way for the Gulf to deal with its own um, with its own opposition in a way of crushing its own dissent is using the Iranian um, sort of fear oh, yeah. scapegoat. Yep. I want to thank you for the tweets, uh, but I do want to dissent from the one which says the <coughs> discussion on Israel and Iran has yet to go beyond pub banter, thanks, John. Ah. Uh, that, that, that certainly seems to me to come from a teetotaler, and also... Uh, this is not uh, vodka, by the way. And also, frankly, I'd like you to take me to that pub, because uh, I, I think we've got more to say. Um, but let's just deal quickly with the other two issues, and then I'm afraid we must draw things to a close, not least because some people may want to get to a pub. Um, uh, diaspora. Um, really interesting question. The Iranian diaspora, I think for much of the last 30 years, has been irrelevant, out of touch, disconnected. I think that even in Shai Najafi pop songs, are you know teased and mocked as, as dinosaurs. Um, so, so I think that it's not really had a role and is not really having a role right now. But I think we see sort of interesting developments on the diaspora scene. I think that the opposition is becoming aware of this and, um, and is trying to gather together. There have been meetings in Prague, there will be another one in Stockholm, trying to um, uh, be prepared to step in if there's a window of opportunity. And I think that it's an interesting experience for this Iranian opposition to sort of try and deal with its own democracy deficit, which exists in the diaspora. Because there are, of course, these cultural problems that 
afflict Iranians anywhere. I don't even know, maybe in Israel. You know, two Iranians is a conversation, a third is a, is a breakaway faction group. Um, <laughs> sort of win-lose scenario where there's <coughs> so much infighting that there's group paralysis. Um, so I think that that's something the opposition is aware of and trying to deal with because they are aware, watching Syria unfold, that there could be a moment where the diaspora and the opposition in the diaspora becomes relevant and it's not prepared today and it's trying to change that. And who really shapes U.S. policy uh, on Iran? That, that, that was an interesting question. Netanyahu. <laughs> He's going to put Wait. your picture on his table tomorrow. Well, <laughs> so, some have argued that Netanyahu should rece receive a Nobel Prize for diplomacy for the influence that he has had, at least on, in terms of like raising the sanctions and everything else, although I think... Although his candidate didn't get elected, let's face it. No, 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 that's absolutely <laughs> right. But that said, he has also helped to orchestrate an extremely strong uh, sanctions regime. And, but I think when we're actually looking for a, a, a dynamic in terms of who is calling the shots on Iran, I think that, that in some respects in Washington you've got you know, various factions that are, that are just too well versed in the default mode, which is more sanctions, and there are very, very few people who are willing to even countenance the possibility of a, you know, of a realistic diplomatic solution because it just, you know, it's just politically too difficult. Why would you do something like that? There's nobody that's out there defending a solution. Everybody is pushing for more sanctions, more pressure, and the feeling is that those things work. What no one sees is what the end result of this is going to be. I mean, do Americans really want to have another war in the Middle East after the last two we've had over the last 11 years? Of course they don't. But where else is this going to go in, in terms of sanctions? It's just continuing to push. Well, look, above all, I would like to thank you very much for being a terrific audience. This is not an easy subject, let's face it. We've proved that tonight. Uh, I mean, there are no easy uh, answers. It is unbelievably complex. But I, I would argue that, that we have, I think, quite sensibly reached a conclusion which Okay, I stand corrected any time it happens, but I think most of us have argued that I I Iran is not going to be bombed, that the consequences, as you have spelt out, Abdelbari Akhlad, are utterly and unbelievably catastrophic if such a thing should happen, and it's very hard to imagine anybody in their right mind deciding to bomb it. Um, and, and that's perhaps an interesting uh, conclusion, but I, I hope we've also tried to look at many other facets of this of this issue, and on your behalf, I'd like to thank Mayor very warmly, Azade, uh, Scott on the end there, and Abdelberry Atwan, who has had to hold a noble, <laughs> a noble fight. <laughs>